So <laughs> welcome, welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining us here today. Uh, we have Jamie Knight and Lion here um, to talk about exploring barriers in XR. This is a, a really amazing research project uh, conducted by Jamie at the, the BBC. Um, and just to int introduce them, Jamie and Lion are an autistic duo who focus on using tech to remove barriers and create positive change. Uh, Jamie spent 10 years with the BBC, working in engineering roles before joining and then leading the digital accessibility team. Since leaving the BBC, Jamie has been focusing on play and adventures and working with a wide range of organizations to make cool things happen. Um, so Jamie, Lion, thank you both so much for being here today and I'll let you take it away. Thanks for the introduction. I shall, I shall crack on. Gosh, with only 15 of us, it's almost like worth doing a round table and inviting everyone over for a coffee. Um, although I think I would need a slightly bigger lounge, but at least you'd all fit on a school bus. Um, okay, so exploring barriers in XR. That's what I'm chatting today. This is for XR Access. Uh, I'm based in London and it's May 2022. Hema. And now they're working. So as, as Dylan just introduced, uh, I'm Jamie and uh, the four foot plushie that you can't see is called Lion. Um, I'm an autistic person and Lion is a four foot long plushy lion. No, he's a cat, so it's hard to tell if he's autistic or not. He's just a cat. Um, and you can find us on the internet at Spaced Out Smiles. Um, I've spent, yeah, just, just shy of 11 years. So 10 and a bit years at the BBC doing, as, as Dylan said, everything from engineering uh, through to accessibility stuff. Uh, and then for the last year, I, I led the uh, digital, uh, audience facing digital accessibility, which was quite fun. Um, and then I'm going through a bit of a transition right now. I'm, I've moved into what I call my summer of fun, um, which could probably be like pronounced summer of adventure, or something like that anyway, uh, which is all about getting out for adventures, riding my bike, making cool things, doing lots of talking and speaking and stuff like that, having lots of fun, having some play in my life, that sort of thing. Um, there is a bit of an irony. I have a spinal cord injury and can't walk much. But with a lot of engineering and duct tape, we managed to build a bike that I could ride. So I am planning to ride the wheels off it in the next six months, just, just to make sure that I can. So that's kind of like the, the, the what I'm doing. But as I said, I've, I've kind of left the BBC. So it's a little bit weird to be talking about the BBC project. And, and this is where our superhero of the day comes in, which is Reese Fowler, who's the creative director for research within the BBC. Um, before I left, I had a natter about the XR access stuff and, and the topic and said, hey, can I go do this one, even though I've kind of left? And he was like, yeah, have at it. As long as you use stuff that's public, you're good. So that's kind of where all of this is from. All the copyright sits with the BBC. I don't own any of this. Um, and all of it is publicly available. If you go through the website, that'll send you a link to later. So last bit of disclaimering, uh, context, uh, I'm going to talk about what I think and why and what we did. It's not formally the opinion of any of my employers, uh, certainly not the opinion of the lion. Um, this isn't science. Um, we're sharing opinion and perspective. The plural of anecdote isn't data, although when there is data behind something, I'll mention it for this one. Uh, and finally, I happen to be neurodivergent slash autistic, but um, I'm speaking for myself, not all autistic people, stuff like that. So that's it for the for the warm ups. Shall we dive into the actual content? So when I'm thinking about XR and accessibility or uh, cross reality or virtual reality, kind of you've got reality, reality at one end and your, your virtual reality at the other. Um, there's a lot of things we can think about that, that, tr that affect the accessibility or, or being able to include people. So you've got things like performance and safety, um, switches, social hardware communities, all sorts of stuff. But it really comes down to one question. And this is, I think, the most important question, which is, who is XR and VR disabled? Who comes into this experience and becomes disabled by it? Now, you might be thinking, Chagman, Jamie, that's a bit weird way of putting it. Isn't accessibility for disabled people? Well, that's one way of looking at it. But it's kind of a bit more complex than that. Um, there's, there's lots of different models. And yeah, the medical model or the identity model, and I would say that I'm a disabled person. But by that, I mean, I often experience environments which disable me. And that is known as the social model of disability. And it's what's uh, the heart of UK law. Um, it's, it's a large part of how we thought or think about accessibility within the BBC. It's the mismatch between an impairment and the environment that results in experiencing disability. That's a little bit different to identifying as disabled or not. That's kind of a slightly different thing. But the idea here is that it's the mismatch. So for example, 
if you were sleeping and a lion came in one night and he nibbled your legs off just below the knee and you got up in the morning and you went and made a cup of tea because of course we're British so you'd have a cup of tea um, you wouldn't be able to reach a kitchen counter because you're now you know two foot shorter than you used to be um, so you can't reach the counter so you've had a change in your body a factual measurable thing and that's the impairment that's the, an impairment is factual and measurable so for example being an autistic person I have all crossing the road impairment. I tend to get hit by cars quite a lot, which is not great. And uh, all sorts of different impairments to do with getting stuff done safely and not getting confused and muddled or distracted. Woo, squirrels. Um, so you have impairment. So yeah, if lion came and nibbled your, leg, nibbled your legs off, you, 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 your impairment would change. So you wouldn't be able to make your cup of tea because you can't reach the counter. But equally, if lion sneaked into your kitchen in the middle of the night, rather than eat your legs, and he got those really big blue screws that you used to hold up kitchen cabinets. And he lifted your entire kitchen three feet higher. And you went to make your cup of tea in the morning. You still wouldn't be able to make your cup of tea because the environment is still disabling you. So this is a really key lens because generally speaking, it's much easier to change an environment. They're much more, I refer to them as mutable. It's much easier to change the environment than it is to change a person. So this, this concept of a barrier as being that mismatch between a person and the environment. Now, for me, this was a really important lens change. Up until the age of you know, mid-20s, I view myself as having autism, that I would defeat and I would try really, really hard to be as normal as possible. But it didn't really work. Um, because what was happening is I was being constantly disabled by the barriers in the environment around me, and I wasn't changing those barriers. I was trying to cope with them. And I kind of had this change from being someone with autism to being an autistic person, where I said, actually, my needs are valid. It's time to change the environment. Now, bringing this all the way, <clears throat> bring this all the way full circle back to XR. XR is this creation of new environments, and with it is the creation of new barriers and new opportunities. And in a nutshell, that's how the BBC VR research project happened. Uh, BBC VR Barriers Research Project. It was VR, called VR Barriers then, and then it came the XR Barriers, and I didn't update the logo. Um, I was chatting to Gareth Williams, my line manager, one day. And I basically said, all the guidelines are good, but they're really speculative. And this was about three or four years ago. I just want to see what happens. I want to know where the barriers are so that we can properly look at the bigger picture. But I, I just want to see, you know, we haven't done any within the BBC of this, of this sort of testing. Let's just go and do some and see what happens. See what we can learn about the barriers. So that's what this talk today is going to be about. We're going to go through three sections. We're going to talk about the lenses we use, uh, what is a barrier. We're going to talk about a project overview, so the big picture, and some things about methodology and, and how we did things. Uh, and then finally, we're going to take you through some highlights, some of the best bits, some of the most interesting bits, some of the most surprising bits. So I'm going to start off by talking about lenses. So this thing, this social model of disability, that's a lens. So that impairment plus environment equals disability, that is a lens. But there are other lenses that come from it. So for example, if, if it's the uh, impairment and environmental mismatch that causes disability, then accessibility could be defined as understanding, preventing and removing barriers, because it's the barriers that go on to disable us. So when we remove those barriers, we are making something more accessible. You could also phrase it as shaping exclusion, but that's a slightly different conversation. So the first part of this talk is about understanding those barriers, those lenses. So that comes to the question of where do barriers come from? And generally speaking, barriers will arise from assumptions. So when we're thinking about where the barriers come from, where, where a bug comes from, it, it might be that it is, you know, a, a finger error. It might be that it's a bug bug, you know, literally, whoops, I put a semicolon in the wrong place, or, or in my case, you know, misspelt the word aria for the hundredth time and got on a train all the way to the other end of the country before I realised, because, oops. Um, so you've got these, you've got these barriers, but, but more often than not, they come from assumptions. They're assumptions that we make as designers and developers about the user's body and their ability. So in the ways that we make assumptions, we kind of think about it in four groups. We think about uh, assumptions to make about the user's motor ability, their cognitive ability, a user's vision and a user's hearing. So for example, in my current situation, I kind of hit a little bit of all four of these. Um, I have a spinal cord injury called cord Aquina syndrome. Um, which has basically fundamentally changed my relationship with gravity. I can't really walk much anymore. Um, that is quite a big change in my impairment. That's quite a big change in my ability, um, in, in, my, uh, in the things I can do. I have a cognitive impairment with the autism and with the ADHD or monotropisms, as I might call it. And that's to do with uh, receiving, processing and acting on information. 
Uh, I have a vision impairment. I am slowly going blind and we don't actually know why, which is a little bit terrifying, but I've got five to 10 years, hopefully. So yeah, doctors, uh, hurry up with that one, please. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, so I'm slowly losing my vision and my vision right now is, is quite impaired from where it was. Um, and I've always had a huge sensitivity on hearing. Now for me, these are a mix of uh, quite impactful and quite uh, trivial experiences. Um, but it depends on the day, you know, if you put me in the wrong scenario on the day with the right, you know, the wrong noises, they will impair me as much as anything else will. They'll, they will just, the, the wrong noises will disable me as much as anything else will. Um, all of these, all of these groups, this group of user impairments, they're all, they, they can all, they all come in these kind of like trivial to substantial or trivial to um, considerable kind of spectrum. Some of them are permanent, some of them are temporary. The next area to think about is ability. So we've talked about assumptions somebody won't make about the user's body, but we also tend to make assumptions about the user's ability. So I actually break this down in, into three different things, which I call ability, capability, and capacity. So ability is that big long list of everything I can do, which for me includes flying a small aircraft. It's the list of absolutely everything that I'm able to do, skills I have. Capability is the much shorter list of the things I could do today. So I'm probably not gonna go and fly an aircraft today. Uh, one, cause I don't have a plane, um, but also even if I had a plane, I'm probably in too much pain. In fact, I'm lying all but flat to do this presentation and staring pretty much at the ceiling, um, which is why the camera is not on. Cause all you do is get a good view of my nostrils. Um, and I'm sure somebody on the internet wants a good view of my nostrils, but I'm gonna assume that you guys don't. Um, so capability is that shorter list of what we can do today. And then capacity is how many of those things can I do? So I might be capable of 10 things today, but I might only have the energy for two or three of them, maybe two big ones and one small one or two small ones and one big one. That's referred to as capacity. Uh, sometimes people might refer to capacity as energy accounting or spoons, same basic idea. Now, the reason why this is important is because as I go through my day, my ability, capability and capacity are always changing. Um, and this actually happens to everybody. Everybody has a difference in capacity between the morning and the evening. Um, and this is something that we need to think about. It's one of the areas that, that we can make assumptions and barriers can sneak in. We can't assume that our users are always on their best um, and always have a great day and low pain and all that sort of stuff. The next part of this is about assumptions we make that relate to the user's uh, social context or environment. So for example, somebody might be riding the tube one-handed, somebody might be in a really bright environment, or somebody might be escaping a fire or running around late for a train. All of these things uh, will affect their ability to do things. Um, and we need to take that into account and we need to make sure we don't assume that all of our users are in perfect environments. So to hammer it home a little bit, the assumptions that we make, they encode, the, the assumptions that we are made are encoded into what we do in the form of barriers. When we assume accidentally that all users are right-handed, we accidentally create games that are impossible to play if you're left-handed, because uh, in order to get to the controls on the touch screen, you have to put your left hand across the content, that sort of thing. So the assumptions we make become encoded into what we've built as barriers. And ultimately it's those barriers that lead to exclusion. So to, to, to kind of put it in a nutshell, the better assumptions we make, the less barriers we have and the less exclusion people experience. So that's kind of a real high nutshell of why we focused on barriers. But there's another bit to it that's also quite empowering. And as a developer, engineer, designer, coder, maker, I don't know, lion tamer myself, this is the bit that's quite exciting for me. If we start in barriers, we can move forward to look at solutions. But also from the barriers, we can move backwards and we can look at the knowledge gaps. So if we can look backwards and look at the knowledge gaps and say, hey, if the designer and developer knew about this thing, they could have designed it out in the first place. Every bug we don't have to fix because it got designed out in the first place means we don't have to have a super clever solution. We still need solutions to a lot of things, but at least we're not making solutions to things that are avoidable. So that is part of the, the scope for the VR project. So thinking back to this title slide, the next part about the project overview, the big picture itself. But for a minute, just gonna think about the lenses, this idea that the barriers are where we should focus they help us find solutions, but they also help us understand where the knowledge gaps are. So the project overview, what I'd call the big picture. And by this, I mean the big picture. So this slide, uh, for anyone who can't see it, um, it's a slide of a really big picture with an arrow pointing at it saying big picture, because I was wondering if people were gonna wonder why I've got a picture of a mountain for this slide's icon. 
So the big picture or the, or the outline of the project kind of breaks down into three areas. I want to talk about the scope of what we explored and why, how our method, the tools and the lessons, and then the outcome, kind of a big map of what we found. So I'm going to start with scoping. So the things that were in scope, we were really interested in understanding kind of three areas, which was navigation within VR, XR, interactions and information gathering. So by navigation, I mean moving around the physical and the virtual space and the combinations of them both. So that might be moving in the small scale or teleportation, or things like that. Interaction is things to do and how to do them. So that might be interacting with objects. It might be interacting with controllers. It might be interacting uh, with noise, uh, music, sounds, you know, light, all these sorts of things. That's the interaction part. And then finally, information gathering, which sounds like a bit of an odd thing to do within the XR space. But really information gathering is like the foundation of our autonomy. Um, we are always putting information out of our environment. And many of the barriers that I experience, both with my vision and with cognitive things, are because I can't access information that's around me. So we'd ask people to do, so our model was the school library, and we'd ask people to answer questions like, when does the library open? To make sure that they could understand, or things like sign, literal signposting around the environment and text and stuff like that. But also some things were not in scope. We weren't setting out to build a set of guidelines. So the barriers are defined. The idea is that a list of barriers is better, better defining the problem. It's not trying to define a solution. Although we ended up in the solution space because when you've got really big barriers, like two thirds of our users can't hold the controller, you kind of have to sort out the big barriers before you can see the small barriers. So we got a little bit waylaid into solution space, but fundamentally we're mostly focused on the barriers themselves, not, not the solutions. We're not aiming to set a guide, write a set of guidelines out of this. We're aiming to write a set of barriers in the form that this barrier occurs when an experience expects the user to, and a thing that the, an assumption that the designer has made and then who it affects and how. The second side of this is this is not a statistics project. We worked with well over hundred users, but we're explorers, not scientists on this. That sample size is not big enough to draw any conclusions. It's one of the reasons we're not releasing that data because it is just downright misleading. We can look at that data and instantly see misleading conclusions that could come from it. And that is terrifying. So we figured it was better to not share it and to share the, the, the large scale stuff than overanalyze it and break it down. And finally, narrative world and scope for this. We built a fun experience and asked people to come and play and have fun with us. But there wasn't a narrative element. There isn't a story within our environment. That's a different set of barriers and something we didn't explore. So that's our scope. So next bit is how. How do we do this? What was our method? What was our tools? What are some of the lessons we learned? Well, at a fundamental level, we got in the car and went places. Uh, we built this virtual environment, which I'll share with you in a tick. Uh, and we went to places. We went to schools and care homes, community events. We turned up at uh, community groups, community events. We turned up at conferences. We turned up all over the place. Uh, we did 15, 15 sessions in total. Uh, so we went to users and then when we got there, we did what we called flip-flop facilitation. So the idea, uh, oh, just one more on that. So before I move on to the flip-flop facilitation, um, we had to make our lab portable. So we built a Peli case that had space for all of our Vive equipment and a slot for the laptop to go in. So we had all of our equipment in one Peli case, two stands, and occasionally we'd need to take a TV. Um, one note, um, we normally, normally work with two to four researchers. Don't try and put the researchers in the case. They don't like it. They prefer to get seats in the car. Um, don't try and put them in the, don't try and put them in the back. They, they don't like it. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ollie. Sorry, Emma. Didn't forget. Um, so the next part is flip-flop facilitation. So this is a thing that we sort of invented by accident. So a flip-flop is just enough shoe to be comfortable. Now, when we're doing a VR user testing session, the facilitator's role is to sort of keep everyone safe and guide the user. It's a kind of a careful blend of support and discovery. And weirdly enough, the person who ended up doing most of it for this project is one of the people who does my day-to-day -day support. Someone who's used to taking me to the shops and stuff like that, a guy called Ollie Gross. Turns out if you've spent 10 years helping autistic people navigate places, you end up pretty good at helping people in VR. It's it's very similar set of barriers and situations. And he had that ability to predict things that would go wrong a little bit before they happened. So a great example would be, he would map what they could see versus the thing he was talking about. So if they're in a situation where they were about to walk into something, he would describe it to them based on the thing they could see. So let's say there's a table and they're walking towards it. 
he wouldn't say watch out for the table he'd say hey there's a bookcase up ahead you know keep a bit of distance from that and if you could teleport to it you'll get re you know you'll, you'll come back to the middle of the space so he, he would mix between virtual and reality um he would do things like if somebody was getting to the edge of the play space he'd say should we go find one of the cups knowing that it was on the opposite side of the play space so they would navigate back to it because we weren't testing the boundaries and stuff like that so that's quite a unique style and i think something that we would likely to see or i'd love to see is more people who are involved in social care getting involved in user testing because in the vr environment it's a much more delicate blend of autonomy and independence so that's flip-flops of communication. It's just a uh, facilitation. It's just enough, uh, flip-flop is just enough to shoot. Flip-flop facilitation is just enough support to keep people safe. And then finally, the last part of our methodology was writing things down. So we just watched what happened and we wrote it down as we went. We'd write down the barrier that we were observing. We also asked for feedback from users. So one of the ways that we did the feedback was our inclusive feedback form. Uh, feel free to steal and build on this form. We went into lots of different places, like special schools, care homes, working with older users, younger users, uh, the um, Blind Veterans Association and all sorts of other organisations. Getting a form that would work for a wide number of people was really hard. This form took four or five revisions and hundreds of hours of work. So feel free to nick it and build on it. It's, 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 it's part of the website. You can go and download it there. So that's kind of what we did. We went out, we uh, had an environment, we took it to lots of places, we observed what happens. Uh, and now the last bit of this is talk about the outcomes, kind of mapping what we found. So fundamentally, the first thing we were aiming for was to build a website, which is to just relay the barriers that we saw. We were hoping to give away the initial data set. That turned out to be a bit ambitious, which I'll come on to in a tick. But the website is up. It's at bbc.co.uk slash accessibility slash for products slash XR. Or if you go to bbc.co.uk slash accessibility, there's a link to it there. So that was the outcome. That was the thing we were aiming for, to publish everything that we saw, this, this list of barriers. So kind of how did we get there? Well, we, we, we did the observing. So that's our first step. Go and observe, take notes. We did 15 sessions, 100 plus users. And then we had a lot of notes. Um, we had 1,700 plus observations from over 100 participants. That was quite a lot. That was a real surprise. We weren't expecting that many things, but yeah, everything. We, we, we got all of these different barriers. Um, and then we kind of had to start doing analysis because a list of 1,700 things you can't remember, it's not usable. So we started doing a thematic analysis and this took literally weeks to basically compare everything against everything else to get them down to about we got down to about 70 without any duplication and they were good but the trouble is they were still describing the barrier they weren't necessarily describing the assumption that led to the barrier and sometimes one barrier was really two barriers so for example uh, dropping a thing and picking it up it would be easy to say that the barrier is dropping but actually it's the barrier is that the game assumed that someone could hold something and the game assumed that somebody could reach the floor so the two motor barriers there are holding and reach, not dropping and picking up. I don't know if that makes sense, but essentially we had to reword a bunch of things to make it make more sense. And then we started looking at the different groups. So we started off with five groups, uh, which were gonna be the motor impairment, cognitive impairment, um, hearing impairment, which we ran from hard of hearing to fully deaf, um, low vision and, and blind. We split low vision and blind for some kind of annoying technical reasons because there were separate code bases and different groups and stuff like that. But um, that was how we split it up. And rather frustratingly, we were basically booked to go and do our second blind group. And we had our first fully deaf group about two months later, right at the start of the pandemic. The project got paused for COVID and we never went and got, we never had an opportunity to go and get that data. So sadly, we can only report on three of the five groups today, which is quite frustrating. We have some of the data, but not enough to be confident. So overall, we started off with something like 1,700 observations, and then we got down to about 20 across three of those five groups. And I'm gonna very quickly share a few of them, but then I'm gonna move on to the highlights because there's a lot in here and we'd be here all day. So the three groups that we had were the motor barriers, the cognitive barriers, and low vision barriers. They're the groups that we had good data for. And this chart here shows the, the 14. So to very, very quickly run through them, the, four, the motor barrier. The, so these are the most common uh, barriers for that group with that impairment. 
So the most common motor barriers were controller holding, controller orientation, input press and hold, uh, multiple input and reach and balance. The most common cognitive barriers were comprehension, expectation, wayfinding, timing, focus and memory and sensory. And the most common low vision barriers were color contrast, determining direction, signage and text. Um, so that, 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 that's kind of like the, the high level, but oh my God, there's so much detail under each one of those. So if you go and look at the barriers browser on the website, you'll find the information for those and the, how they break down. But we also have lots of other resources in kind of this project. So we have deep dives on switch control because we made it all work with switches. Uh, we have deep dives on performance testing. We built some performance testing robots. Um, my, my line manager insisted that nobody was allowed to die taking part in the project. So I had to do some work to prove that it was safe, even if the machine had been running for four or five hours. And I wasn't going to sit there for four or five hours with a headset on. So I built a robot to do it for me because, you know, I'm lazy and building robots is fun. I genuinely had a day where I was like, I work at the BBC and I'm building a robot. This is really cool. Um, and I don't think many days have been that cool since, but it was a cool moment. Um, there's also a deep dive into low vision adaptions and a deep dive into that inclusive feedback form and how we built it. Uh, there's also lots of presentations. There's a motor barriers deep dive presentation, a cognitive barriers deep dive presentation, an overview presentation, and a how to test in VR presentation. Um, and then we've also got a gallery, posters, session posters, feedback forms, all that sort of stuff. So that's all up on the website. Um, here's a couple of quick screenshots. Barrier browser looks like the thing on the left. The deep dives and stuff look like the thing on the right. I don't have the time here to give them justice to go through all 14. So I think I'm gonna just instead focus on some of the highlights. Now, rather handily, that's the third part of this talk, highlights, some of the best bits. So these are some of the bits that jumped out at me as either surprising or interesting. So they're what I'd like to share to finish up. So in all, I wanna talk about three highlights. I wanna highlight one of the deep dives, which was into motor barriers and switch control. I wanna highlight one of the barriers which was uh, into cognitive, in the, it's a group of cognitive barriers, but the specific barrier is the barrier that we call expectations. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to tell you a bit of a story about one of our methods and one of the things we got wrong with our method, which is to do with the process of getting people into VR and the concept of controllers first, and why we ended up at always do the controllers first. But first, I'm gonna do that deep dive into the motor barriers stuff. So the motor barriers were really interesting. At the high level, they were really broad, they were really impactful, and they were really challenging. In many of our early groups, the users simply couldn't hold the controllers. There was no way for them to get into or move the environment at all. They either had a cognitive impairment, a physical, or, a, or some other impairment, or, or coordination impairment, that, that meant the controllers were inscrutable. Um, and we saw, kind of saw that as a failure on our side, that we only had the controllers that the Vive came with. We then ended up making the environment work with an Xbox controller, which worked better, but it still couldn't meet the needs of all of our users. So in order to not lose the small barriers, we had to overcome some of the big barriers. And to do this, we built switch control. So the way that it worked is we had an Xbox adaptive controller, which was in somebody's bag or zip tied to their chair. And then that uses um, click switches. So you have a little bit like ping pong balls and you, you tap them and it counts as a click. We also had blow tubes, um, we also had head mounted um, tap tubes, all sorts of things. I've got a photo later showing some of the switches we used. And what it enabled us to do was take the input from the user and then move them around the environment in different, in different ways. It was really interesting because it was so impactful. Like we, we went from someone who was completely excluded from the environment to being able to move around the environment freely and then with that same adaption, move around most VR environments freely. Um, by the time we got the XAC up and running, anything that could support an Xbox controller could support the users using this equipment. It was rather surreal. As, as an accessibility person, it was probably one of the most impactful things I ever saw. And dear God, it was challenging at the time. We were a bit early in the process. So the XAC didn't have a proper driver. So I had to learn how to sign Windows drivers and all sorts of stuff. But it was great. So that's the motor barriers group and the switch control. But then there's also like a bit more detail in there as well. So this is the table showing some of our switch controls. The XAC is on the right. We have a contact switch, a distance shift switch, a microphone switch that you just make a noise, um, big buttons, small buttons, tap buttons. Uh, and then underneath is some of the a diagram of some of the different control schemes we had. So some of the control schemes relied on where the user was looking. 
Some of the control schemes uh, relied on the user being able to rotate on the spot and then move backwards and forwards. Um, it's, all, it's all featured in one of the deep dives. So that's why I'm saying this is one of the highlights for me. This is probably my favorite deep dive. Although I opened the PDF today and I noticed that I've accidentally copied and pasted one of the pages twice. So three, three year project, thousands of hours of work. And it's a month after I leave the BBC that I noticed that I, I put a massive uh, typo, a massive mistake in one of the release documents. Uh, oh, well, uh, we do have a presentation as well that, that, that talks about all of these control schemes and how they worked and stuff. So if, if you're interested in this stuff, go check it out. The second area that was really fascinating for me and one of the highlights uh, is a specific barrier that we found in the cognitive barriers group that we called expectations. So cognitive barriers are a thing for me. I'm autistic. They're a thing I experience a lot. But that's not kind of why this is a highlight for me. The reason it's a highlight is because by far the cognitive barriers were the most subtle and the most intersectional. They overlapped with almost everything else. Almost every other barrier we experienced had a cognitive element to it or a cognitive flip side, if that makes any sense. Either the, the cognitive side would, would make recovering from, say, a mobility issue. So, so for example, if one of the mobility um, barriers was um, pressing and holding. So you'd think just pressing and holding a button, that can be tricky for some users. Um, but there's a cognitive side to that as well, which is knowing you need to press and hold the button or knowing that you're still holding the button or it kind of it's, it's the understanding that goes with it, the conceptual understanding or things, things like that. It was really surprising just how much cognitive barriers, that comprehension, expectation, uh, wayfinding, uh, sensory, et cetera, um, impacted everything else. Um, this, this is something that surprised us. We had a number of, of blind users come and work with our environment and the fact they couldn't see it didn't actually matter much. It was the fact that they didn't understand what was in front of them because of how badly it was communicated or that a concept was missing or a concept hadn't been explained um, that, that often tripped people up. So it was a very, very eye-opening experience. And I think if you look through the barriers browser and you look, and you look at the cognitive barriers, start there. They're kind of the foundation barriers. Get that right first, because if you don't get that right, everything else is kind of going to fall apart. And of those barriers, the one that surprised me most was expectation. So expectation uh, we define as when a user expects a thing. So for example, users might expect sounds or shadows. If they pick up a mug and they put the mug back down, then that's an expectation barrier. So uh, we phrase it somewhere along the lines of uh, when an experience expects the user, uh, when, when the experience, um, gosh, I'm going to muddle up my words now when the experience expects the user to do a thing. So uh, when the experience expects the user to understand, you know, uh, shadows and noise. In fact, I've got the wording entirely wrong for that one. I'm getting to the end of my day. Go look it up on the website. It's got the thing. Two examples that, that spring to mind. Um, we had this idea that users have an expectation of shadows and sound. We were expecting that. But users also have this expectation to be safe. And we really found that if you took somebody from a, if you took somebody and you put them into a situation that wouldn't be safe in the real world without warning, that broke this expectation. That was a huge barrier. One of our early pieces of 360 degree uh, video was about Crossrail, a new train station. And um, the video starts from under a train where the train rolls backwards to reveal this massive tunnel. You're supposed to go, wow, that's an amazing tunnel. What most users did was go, oh, my God, I'm under a train. That's not good. Um, so that was an expectation that users didn't feel safe. Another good example for expectation with a mix of mobility and cognitive is that we had cobbles in the garden and we had several users who used sticks get up to the door and not walk any further because they knew they couldn't walk on cobbles. They were worried about falling over. They didn't have the cognitive understanding that the floor would still be flat. But it makes a lot of sense. And we wouldn't have expected that because that, what we've done is we've broken their expectation. Their expectation is that what their eyes are telling them about the floor can be used to work out whether they can walk on it. And then there's also just the weird and bizarre. So for example, this is skirting board. In the UK and around the world, we put little bits of wood at the bottom of our rooms. If I took away the skirting board, everybody noticed. It was really, really strange. I have no idea why, but if you want to make your VR environment look realistic, make sure you've got skirting board. Otherwise, everybody will notice and point out to you that there's no skirting board in the sensory room. Very strange. 
but quite delightful and quite a surprise. The last thing that I want to talk about as a highlight is actually something we did wrong, which is one of the things we got wrong with our method, which was to do with our process of introduced, the order in which we introduced things. So our process evolved as we went. It was very iterative. Each time we went into the session, we would refine the process. We're not there to do science. We're there to explore and find as many barriers as possible and gain an understanding of the bigger picture. So we, don't need, we didn't need to have repeatability from every single session, as long as it was generally being more and more, um, if it was revealing more barriers, that was a good thing. But we also didn't need, we also needed to solve enough barriers that, some, that the same barrier didn't re-emerge and end up losing us time. Um, so that was another thing, which is sometimes we took steps to remove a barrier because we've seen it a hundred times before, so we don't need to see it again, so it's time to move on. So we evolved our method. Now, one of the things that we evolved it to was this idea of always introducing the controllers first. This was the result of a bit of a mess up. We uh, had gone to a, what in the UK we'd call a special school or a special educational needs school or, or SEN. Um, and we were working with a young lady who had quite a profound learning uh, disability or learning impairment. Um, and she was wonderful. And she sat on the floor and she, she, she wore the headset a bit like a set of goggles, kind of looked in, pulled it down, looked in. And over about 10 minutes, she got comfortable with it. And we kept saying to her, nothing in there is real. Nothing can hurt you. There's nothing to worry about. You're all good. And then she got to the point where she started wanting to move. So Ollie, who was doing the facilitation, picked up one of the controllers, walked across and, and, and went to hand it to her, at which point she completely freaked out. She got really scared and, and the person with her was able to calm her down. And we were a bit confused until we realised that from her perspective, we've told her that nothing is real. But from her perspective, something got up off the floor, floated towards her and then bumped into her. So we'd broken that expectation that she had. We had, we, our process had actually been a barrier all of its own that meant we lost that session and, and, and upset that user. And we made sure we put it right. You know, we made sure that she felt safe before we ended and, and you know, the school were really great working with us on that. Um, the user wasn't at any point actually at risk of harm. That's kind of important to say. We, we were very careful with these things. So we ended up changing our process. We would always have a TV and we would hold the headset up and we would show the, 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 the user, the participant, the controller inside VR from the perspective of the headset. So they can see that the, the controller they're holding is in VR, but it's a, a picture of the controller, not the actual controller. That's why they can't see their hand. We would explain it to them that way, get them comfortable with the controllers, even doing teleporting. Then we would move them into the headset. And that way we were able to find more and more of the barriers rather than losing sessions to very confused people with controllers. Because it turns out once somebody is in VR, if you hand them the controller afterwards and they've never seen it before, they don't have a visual reference. And as that earlier example pointed out, sometimes you can really scare people and really freak people out. Whoops. So the last section of this section um, is basically me just showing some cool photos, which I'll describe because it was such a cool project. So this is a, a picture of our environment. It was a model of a school library with a main, a main library area full of bookcases. Many of the books were interactive, but not quite all of them. Uh, some of the books had Easter eggs. So the, the books about space didn't have any gravity applied. So you could throw them around the room like Frisbees. Uh, one of the kids we worked with, um, who wasn't very verbal, um, again, at one of the special schools, um, built what I could only describe as a book Large Hadron Collider where he would stand at one end of the room and throw the book with no gravity. He would teleport to the other end of the room, pick up another book and then throw it at the book that was flying towards him. We didn't have any specific thing that people needed to do in this environment. And almost everybody made up their own game. Almost everybody found something to do to the point where we were hiding Easter eggs all over the place. So we had this, uh, this main library space. Uh, we had a sensory room, we had a reception area and a garden, and in the garden were various interactive objects, but also hidden around the back was a set of stairs to get to the, to get to the roof. If you worked out how, you could jump the garden wall and then walk all the way around the outside of the environment and stare into the abyss if you really wanted to. So the environment is uh, it's white, it's got um, light wells, it's got a wooden floor and bookshelves. Um, and this is a, on the left is a screenshot of the um, library space and on the right is, is like a three quarter view zoomed out of the whole environment within Unreal. 
And then the next thing is, is an example of the flip-flop facilitation. So uh, I don't know if Ollie is actually wearing flip-flops in this photo, which is part of why it got called flip-flop facilitation, because Ollie often wears flip-flops. But this is Ollie supporting a user. Uh, they're using, uh, I think, the head-based uh, movement. So they have an XAC in their bag. They have a switch controller in their hand. They have the headset on, and then there's a controller that's uh, zip-tied to the headset. So as they look in different directions, the, head, the, the controller is moving with them. When they press and hold the switch button, the blue teleportation line comes out. They can look in the direction they want to go, and then when they let go, it'll teleport them there. So this was just taking advantage of the fact that it was easy to, to get the location of the controller. You could do this just using the data from the headset, um, which we did later, but I didn't know how to program that then. And we only had the idea that morning, so we just used zip ties. Uh, the second picture on the right is one of the VR performance testing robots. Uh, I cobbled it together from a CNC milling machine, a little engraving machine. Um, and it's basically the, the place where the motor would go on an engraving machine. There's a, a, a tube of toothpaste and then the headset is just taped around the tube of toothpaste. But what it would do is it would continuously move the headset in random ways for eight hours, which would cause, which would mean that I could run the environment. I could use performance testing tools to make sure that the frame rate was stable. And I could understand what happens when the machine starts to overheat. Because we were using a laptop, the GPU and the CPU would fight each other for thermal stability. And the actual sustainable performance after an hour was only about a third or, or a half of what it was when the machine was first turned on. So we had to make sure that it was safe. And that's one of the ways we did it. We did several different methods. There's another deep dive about those as well. Uh, we built one with bungee cords, which was quite cool because we just needed random movement. So we just did it with bungees. Um, random movement, thing oscillating all over the place and checking that it, it, it kept tracking, that it kept its uh, frame rate up and stuff like that. So that's what I've talked about today. I've talked about the lenses, what is a barrier anyway, and the idea that assumptions lead to barriers and barriers lead to exclusion. But from the barriers, we can go forward into solutions or backwards into knowledge and training. So if we come across a barrier, we can either solve it by solving the barrier, or potentially we can go and work with whoever created the barrier to help them understand something better, to challenge one of their assumptions that they made so that they, make, so that they don't make the barrier again. We also talked about the project overview, the big picture, the scope of the project, the method and how we did it. And then I've also shared some of the highlights. So to start wrapping up, at the very start of this, I said that XR is the creation of new environments and the creation of new barriers. This is really important. I think XR and VR and all that technology will fail if we just replicate the same barriers that we have in the real world in the virtual world. And we get there by these poor assumptions. Everything that we can do now to better understand the barriers will feed the future. The solutions are important. You know, I love the people who are doing very clever solutions, but it's really the barriers that are critical. We're in the position that WCAG and other stuff was in maybe 10 or 15 years ago, where the barriers are more important than necessarily the solutions. The solutions have got decades to improve, but they need to come from a good beginning. Ultimately, we get to decide who does XR and VR disable? It's not my disability or my named condition that excludes me from XR. It's the assumptions of others and the barriers they encode into the environment. When we get this right, we are turning potential into reality for a vast number of users. So it could be billions of users. And that is exciting. And that is amazing. And that's one of the reasons I love doing digital accessibility. We are in the business of helping people with potential to thrive, and I can't think of a better job than that. So that's the end of this talk about the BBC VR Barriers Project. As a, a double reminder, I don't work for the BBC anymore, um, although I do still make a podcast for them called 1800 Seconds on Autism, which is a bit confusing because it's, it's in the BBC Sounds app, but it's made by the BBC, but not that bit of the BBC. It's very confusing, but I still do some BBC stuff, just not on the digital stuff. Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Spaced Out Smiles, uh, jamieandlion.com, spacedoutsmiling.com. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening. And um, I'm kind of open to questions. I'm very bad at ending things. Dylan, help, I've finished now. What should I do? Absolutely, thanks Thanks so much, Dave. That was an amazing talk. Um, we do have some time for Q&A. Um, if people want to uh, either enter their questions in chat, 
um, or raise your hand using the Zoom interface uh, it's under reactions. We can call on you to um, unmute and undo your camera. Um, let me start out uh, just to, to pop one at the top of the queue using uh, my, my host privilege here. Um, I, I'm really curious when it comes to enabling the, the Xbox adaptive controllers. I know a lot of VR headsets these days um, are very, very specific about this is the type of hardware they will accept and trying to enable things like, like alternative control schemes, switch controls, things like that can be really difficult. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that process and about the, the barriers you encountered with being able to even set up, you know, controllers that people could use. I can, I can give you three levels of nerdy. So I will start at the deepest level of nerd, then I'll go to the medium level, then I'll go to the high level that you have today. Uh, when I first started this, the XAC wasn't part of the standard Microsoft driver set. So I ended up working with a Microsoft game studio to get them to custom sign a driver for me so that I could even get the XAC to talk to the computer. At that point, the XAC driver presented it as an Xbox 360 uh, device over USB to, the, uh, to Unreal, the game engine we were using. And then within Unreal, I made sure that there was a mapping to all of the normal Xbox buttons to map all of what was normally on a, an Unreal controller. Of course, we didn't get the location information. So that had to come through a different channel, such as the headset or any of the other switch location stuff we did. Um, that's probably better detailed in, in the deep dives as it gets quite nerdy. The second level up is these days, there's more abstraction. So things like OpenVR, where the abstraction layer is being built into the VR environment rather than the, the game engine, that's quite good. So I'm pretty sure that OpenVR and VRTK and the brain will come back to me in a minute. I'm sure someone knows what I'm talking about. It's the, the thing for Unity, is it device manager, device mapper? Somebody save me, please, I'm dying. It's one of those things. Something like that um, is now out for Unity and things like that. That's quite a powerful tool because it essentially enables you to configure at the platform and environment level. Uh, and then in the third end of it, is um, when you actually have the switches and stuff all up and going, the configuration ends up being different for every user. So the XAC has got a whole bunch of like three and a half millimeter audio jacks on the back. That's how you plug the switches in. And that meant that the XAC could say to say that A was moved forward, um, but then what actual switch we plugged into it was all up to the user. So some users would have a bite switch, some users would have a contact switch. So that way the the, the XAC was a, a bridge between the software world and the real world, and we had flexibility on both sides. Uh, we also introduced buttons to do things like reset the environment. So we had a button that put everything back on the shelves where it started, because that, so then if people drop things, they could reset the environment and bring everything back. Um, so does that kind of help explain kind of, there's the three different levels of abstraction, and you're right, some of the proprietariness, not naming anyone in particular, <clears throat> is certainly a problem because they're getting in the way of the ability to do adaptive input. But um, we're going in a good direction on that. And at least, in the, at least in Europe, it's likely to get caught up in the European Accessibility Act at some point, at which point they won't have a choice. They have to open it up. So maybe there's some good change coming there. Gotcha, excellent. Um, okay, then we have a question from uh, Lisa or Liza here. Go ahead and, and unmute. Yep, uh, my name's Liza. I'm a VR developer. And I have Hi. a... Hi. <laughs> uh, first of all, this was fantastic. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to look through all the materials on the BBC website. And yeah, this is, this is great. So thank you. Um, and so one of the biggest assumptions... Uh, I usually develop for Oculus Quest, but I think one of the biggest assumptions that VR developers and VR headset makers make is that um, players will be seated or standing and not lying down. So that's a big request that I've, I've heard a lot from disabled people um, and really a lot of people who would like to play lying down. So the request we usually get is, can I rotate my avatar? Sorry, this is a long question. Um, <laughs> can I rotate my avatar so that I can be lying down and play the game as I would if I were sitting or standing? And so I, I hacked something together. I tried that. I tried just rotating it. And it's, it's pretty bad. It's playable, but like it's disorienting. And if you look to the, to the side, everything gets tilted. And so my question, after all that context, is, is it worth it to release a, a bad solution or a half solution um, that, that people have been asking for if I, if I can't get it to be good and polished in a game? The answer, the answer is yes. As long as it <laughs> is 
safe or comes with enough warnings? Because if the difference is do not access or access in a weird way, give users the choice. So funnily enough, because of my spinal cord injury, I spent a lot of time lying flat. If my pain levels are high, it's you know 15 or 16 hours a day that I'm lying flat and I don't really have a choice. I would love a bad VR experience. Um, interestingly enough, I have not even attempted it yet. Um, it's, I've only had my injury a year and um, there's a little bit too much trauma and grief, to be honest. I'll get there with it, but I'm not there yet. But um, a bad experience beats no experience. If it's a choice between total exclusion or something a bit weird, but maybe I can deal with it, I'd rather go for the it's a bit weird and maybe I can deal with it because ultimately we're just giving users choice. Um, the other side of it is it's amazing how one idea from one person can spur another idea. And you might find that somebody somewhere goes, oh, hang on a minute, I can unskew that head tilt, but I could have never worked out how to rotate the environment. So it's, it's good. I'd say put it out with open source, put a massive warning on it. Like make sure it's very clear to users that they understand that it may not be safe, that they need to take their own precautions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I'd say release it, talk about it, tweet about it, put it on Reddit, get information out there, see what, see what, see what users do and think what feedback they give you. Um, and yeah, that, that sounds kind of wonderful. I'm now all kind of curious because daftly, I've had a spinal cord injury for a year and I hadn't actually considered trying to do VR lying down. Hadn't even occurred to me yet. So uh, ooh, that's a nice idea. Also, um, um, please can I be the first person in the queue for a copy of that code? <laughs> I'd like to that. <laughs> yeah, it's so I, I'll have to make it game specific because, um, you know, but I'll, I'll talk to, I've, I've been talking to other VR developers about this. And I think we all kind of have the same question of, you know, do we release something that's disorienting? Um, so I'm gonna just go back to everyone and be like, yes, we do. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, you know, there's issues with also helping people find games that allow these things. It's hard, you know, on platforms. Um, so there's more questions about getting platforms to like show what, you know, can games be played lying down? Can they be played one handed? But sorry, I'm rambling. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that one's also outside of the scope of what we did. Um, yeah. I can see so many business and other barriers, but they weren't part of what we looked at. It's the same as um, we know we missed barriers because we, have, we hear people talk about them, but we strictly follow the rule that if we didn't see it, it didn't go in the list. So we know that our list is not comprehensive, that there's more out there, but we figured that it was better to have, it's not scientific purity, that's the wrong way of putting it, but better to have consistency and say, everything on this list is something we have seen. And it is really nice because we've got that first initial list of like 1,700 barriers, and every single one of them maps to one of those 14 categories. And I can literally go, you know, category 2.3, which I think is um, uh, cognitive barriers number three, uh, which I think is wayfinding, I can't remember. Um, and literally go, here are the 107 observations that related to that. And I love that. Um, I'm not allowed to release the data set, like the core data set, the 1700 barriers. It is with the BBC lawyers and hopefully we will be able to get it out one day. But we, we, well, I left the BBC a month ago and we just couldn't get the paperwork done in time. Um, so hopefully that will come in the future and other people can do even more analysis of it. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Also, um, another pro tip, uh, don't do handwriting, do digital notes, because you discover that everybody around you appears to write in Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, and I, I literally lost data from like the first two sessions where everybody looked at it and went, none of us had the clue what that says. Even the person who wrote it didn't know what it said. So yeah, digital notes from the beginning, do that. Oops. Amateur, we were so focused on the VR barriers, we forgot the basics, like make sure you can read the notes. So Jamie, I'd, I'd love to get um, get your opinion on, on two things before we, we leave here. Um, those being going forward, uh, what would you say are the biggest things that uh, platform owners and, and content creators can do to help enable accessibility in their uh, experiences? And then you also said that, you know, this research got uh, cut short a bit, I think, by COVID. Um, yeah. What would you say are the, the biggest targets that any, any researchers listening now should, should target for um, their own research going forward? Um, okay, so the first one, what would I ask platform owners to do? Uh, open things up for different types of controller and different types of input output. 
um, please give us things like audio streams in clean forms so we can run them through things like speech to language, um, sorry, speech to text, um, and just kind of give us access to be able to do controllers and controller mapping in the places where we don't. I'm not going to name the company, but I'm pretty sure you know who I'm referring to. Um, so that's one thing, which is like, hey, proprietary company, please be less proprietary. Um, the, so that was the first question. The second question was around where are the holes in this? Uh, you can drive a bus through the holes relating to, you know, between low vision and blindness. We just didn't get enough users in the time we had. We had more users set up. We had more tools set up to explore, but we just didn't get there um, before COVID hit us. Um, so that would be good. Uh, we did a whole bunch of work around low vision things. So for example, one of the things we had was um, we, had a, the, we had the default hands, which were you know, white plastic and we had white walls. So of course, many users couldn't see their own arms. So we implemented a system that you could pick what color your arms were. So they would always have contrast. That worked great until you walked into a dark place. And I never worked out how to create glow in the dark arms, but that would be cool. That, that's that's a, a barrier that we observed with this color contrast and being able to distinguish things. I think there is huge opportunity in that distinguishing things kind of area. Uh, and then the second area would be the hard of hearing and deaf. Um, we, we played with a few bits and bobs. We started playing with ways to get subtitles and captions into the experience um, using an RSS reader and a piece of code in Unreal that was cobbled together off an example on the internet. And I didn't really get it working in time. And then, and then we just ran out of time. So I think that's kind of a real opportunity. And then the third opportunity is um, special schools. Like you learn so much so fast by going to the users that, that have the largest barriers. The, the students, they are our teachers, they are amazing. And um, I think one of the accidental but best decisions we made on the project was to start by visiting a friendly special school that we knew who wasn't too far away and would let us have an experiment and, and work with their students. So kind of, I think there'd be my three things. So there's the distance between low vision and blind. There's everything in the hearing spectrum still to go. Um, and then there is like, if you're starting anywhere, start, start with, 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 with special schools and, and education and that sort of stuff. They are often the most vulnerable users, but they also have incredible insights. So do the staff that support them. And I find it sort of ironic that the person who does my social care to stop me from getting run over, it turned out to be the best VR facilitator ever but we had to keep teaching him about not giving leading questions and stuff like that because he hadn't done any facilitation. But it was much easier to teach him how to stop asking leading questions than it was to try and explain to someone who's done lots of facilitation how to predict two steps ahead and turn someone around without them noticing versus Ollie does it to me all the time. Oh, Jamie, what's that over there? Oh, I don't know. Stops me from walking into a lamppost. So, you know, that, that was kind of ironic and amazing. And that, now at this point, I'm monologuing again, so I shall stop monologuing. No worries. I think that's that's some great answers. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, I wanted to thank Jamie and Lyon, of course, for uh, for speaking today. Um, it's amazing. We'll, we'll have the recording of this uh, up on our events page uh, soon enough. Um, I also want to take a moment to uh, remind everyone that the XR Access Symposium uh, on June 9th and 10th has just opened up for registration. So uh, you can check out uh, that at xraccess.org slash symposium. Um, Jamie is going to be on a panel there on uh, inclusive user testing. So be sure to check that out. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you again to Jamie and uh, we'll hope to see you all again soon.